Good morning, good evening, welcome everyone, and welcome to this, I believe, the 18th episode of this Indic Chat. I'm your host, Avina Bagarwal, and I'm going to be talking with a slightly unusual guest today in more ways than one. Uh, first, as you know, this month we celebrate 70 years of India becoming independent, that we are still not free from the clutches of colonialism and mental enslavement is quite another thing, and I'm really hoping that our guest today will... Uh, share his experiences in uh, uh, you know on that topic, but uh, again, as I said, you know that's a that's a, a topic in itself for another day and a, another chat. So uh, for those of you who know me, I'm going to try and do something different today. I'm going to you know try and be positive. I uh, shed some of my natural cynicism for an hour or so, and we'll focus on the good news that is all around us. So difficult though it may be to spot, and our guest today is a believer in exactly that, the good news. So coming back to my point, which is that we celebrate 70 years of our independence, uh, I've already said that. So what better way to mark this month than by talking with someone who has literally lived through this era. He was born before 1947 in the era of uh, pre-independent colonial India, has recollections, even some vivid memories that he's going to share with us of that time. And uh, uh, he has lived through partition, through Pandit Nehru's era, liberalization, and more. So, without any further ado, let me welcome our guest today, which is Sri D. V. Sridharan, a uh, self confessed sea dog, an Anglophile who rediscovered that he was a Hindu at the age of 70. And he has been featured in the Reader's Digest, and, uh, which showcased his work on a 15 acre plot of land near Chennai. Uh, he has his website, goodnewsindia.com, uh, and uh, he has uh, uh, another venture, uh, and he's going to talk about that. So, with all of that, welcome all, and a very hearty welcome to you, Sri Devi. Good evening. Good evening, Abhinav. Thank you. Thank you. I know so much about you. I've been a keen follower of your chat shows, and I'm very fond of your book reviews. They go far beyond book reviews. Uh, they certainly promote the books you're writing about, but then you also promote a fondness for reading. I, I, I love your work. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for speaking. Thank you. So uh, I will not go about this chronologically, but uh, I do want to start with the era before partition since, uh, you know, you uh, were born before partition. Now, uh, I believe you were a, uh, if I may say, use the word, you were a lad of about five when India got independence. Do you have any recollections from that time of, uh, you know, uh, colonial India, of uh, partition, and or even, you know, memories of the British, of the English? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. I think I, I have a precocious memory. I mean, I, uh, I recalled many things quite vividly. Uh, not in great detail, but in generally fairly accurately. Uh, oh. One of the first things I remember was uh, being carried into the Meenakshi temple in Madurai uh, by my mother, who was about 24 years old. And that must have been 1946. Uh, uh, so Gandhi was coming, so she took me and somehow forced herself in and then got me blessed, touched and blessed by Gandhi. I, mean, I remember the buzz uh, over the uh, DV, if I may request you uh, uh, to be a little louder, I think uh, uh, your voice is coming a little uh, low. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, that was the uh, first recollection that I do have uh, of uh, being in the same space as Gandhi in Madurai and my mother's arms. And then uh, shortly thereafter, my mother died and I moved to a place called Tambra, which is uh, far... It, it used to be a different town from Chennai, now it's a suburb of Chennai. It is a college town, uh, Madras Christian College and the Air Force Base. And I grew up for the next seven years with my grandfather. And that's when India got free. And before that, the war ended. I remember that. My grandfather reached out to me, the war is over. But before that, he told me a big bomb had been dropped in Japan. I remember that too. And he told me about the horror of the bomb. And I listened to that. And then 
we lived in, I don't know how much detail I should go into, but then since you asked me, let me indulge myself. We lived in a large house where we paid a rent of about 20 rupees, I think. And our neighbors were four Englishmen. They lived in a house of their own. And there were a lot of cows, and they were quite periodically used to shoot a cow. And really? it up, share it among their friends. I think I don't know what happened. So I used to run up to the fence and watch the cow being slaughtered. And I would run back and tell my grandfather, not a cow gone. He used to be quite furious. And he used to tell me, Gandhi is going to throw them out. You just wait, he used to say that. And so Gandhi was a big name. He was already quite a popular name for me. And then one day he told me, we are free. Shortly, in a few days, India will become free. He told me that too. I remember that. I was quite excited. I didn't know what it meant. So, but then he said, we will be our own. We will rule ourselves. And all the Englishmen in the neighborhood, they were all gone. And they did, shortly thereafter. So I remember that. And I remember the flag hoisting in a little park next to the hall. About 10, 15 people showed up. And we all dressed in our washed clothes, not ironed. In those days, nobody ironed their clothes. So, sun dried clothes. So, I remember that. Uh, that's about all. It was a small uh, college professor's uh, colony. And we lived in a large hat. I was a barefoot schoolboy, quite happy. So, that's the uh, uh, pre independence India. And uh, India becoming uh, independent. I remember being taken to Chennai city. We took an electric train the first time I went. They took me to show the illumination of Madras city. It was all lit up beautifully. Ah, there was crowds wall to wall. It was hemmed by crowds. My grandfather carried me and showed me all the lights. And I thought something extraordinary is going to happen all like that. India becoming free. That's <laughs> it. But it didn't in, in many ways, you know, while, uh, you know, a lot of the people who were aware at that time when India got independent, you know, the, maybe there was this excitement that something extraordinary would happen. But as we all know, uh, it didn't really. But you, I, I want to ask you about, you know, you said you are, uh, you know, and you were an Anglophile. And uh, for someone who grew up in Pandit Nehru's India, uh, you know, for our viewers, you know, excuse my saying so, but self-loathing was not altogether surprising in a country that was desperately poor and uh, unable to, you know, bring itself out of poverty with the, you know, with the Nehruvian rate of growth of 2 and 3%. And you also had eminent authors like Nirad Chaudhary and the early phase of Naipaul that uh, sort of accentuated that sense of uh, despondency and self-loathing about India. And, you know, whose writings were marked by harsh critiques on India, the country, and even India, the civilization itself. And we know that we are, you know, Naipaul changed his views in the 1970s, but do tell us about that era where, uh, you know, you, you, I believe you said you, you experienced a sort of a cultural alienation. Yeah, I'll let it go back a little bit, if I may. Uh, I got to start a little earlier too, so that there's a continuity in what I'm saying. Uh, see, both Gandhi and Nehru were heroes to me for many, many years. In real time, they were heroes. And my subsequent critique of them came much later, uh, uh, when I became aware of the realities of the politics, looking back at the politics. But in real time, they were very big heroes to uh, me. Didi, can I interrupt you and, and, and request you to uh, maybe you know check your computer's uh, volume, uh, your mic volume? Uh, I'm getting a couple of you know people who are saying that your volume is fairly low, and and you know even I am uh, uh, finding it a little difficult to catch everything. I'm, I'm surprised. So uh, let me come closer to the screen. Is it better now? It is uh, somewhat better. Uh, is your is it, is your computer's uh, microphone? Uh, yeah, a little later. Uh, after, uh, shortly after independence, I went away to Bangalore. I, my mother had died and I rejoined my father when I was 10. And uh, I went to a Tamil medium school. And I do want to talk a little bit about those days. Uh, am I coming through now? Yes, yes, it's better. Yeah. All right. 
Okay. Now, I used to be taken to Nehru's meetings by somebody or the other, and uh, he was a big hero. But slowly, uh, I think uh, the people were very, very concerned in those days, mostly about permanence of jobs, tenure, uh, and everyone wanted to retire. Uh, jobs they could get. Jobs were not easy to get. So the whole accent was to go away from your culture and disown it and uh, learn English. You see, English was an aspirational language. It was a key to getting a job and everyone aspired to it. And I must go back to it and already there had been a cultural disruption the first wave of migrations from the villages of the Brahmins had already happened. And I remember going to my village uh, about near Kanchipuram in Tamil Nadu, here near Chennai. I, I got taken several times by my grandfather. I'm very grateful to him for that. But then the Brahmins had already migrated. Several years later, they were to migrate from there to the US, where they mostly are. But then they all migrated for jobs. And one of the keys was English. So my father insisted I should go to a Tamil medium school and learn Tamil. But he was not particular about my learning Sanskrit, which is to my great regret, I lost out on. He himself knew it very well. He had been raised orthodoxly. He was studs, diamond studs in his ears and a tuft until he was a teen and he hated it. He knocked it off and he didn't want to do that to me. So English was an aspirational thing. So after the Tamil medium school, I longed to learn English. And uh, I found I had no self-confidence about speaking it. I could read it after a fashion. So the desire to learn English was the beginning of the Anglophilia that developed much later. You see. And that was fairly uh, the way with my entire generation. Uh, we all wanted to know. In our house, there were three books. I still remember just three books in English. Uh, one was Cakes and Ale by Somerset Mom. I couldn't pronounce his name then. And then there was um, a book by Aldous Huxley. And there was a third book, Bhagavad Gita. And that's the English book. I used to riffle through it all the time, not knowing how to read. So the aspiration to learn English began then. And it was many, many years, it just another 10 years before I could read a whole English book. But I loved that language. And slowly the alienation began, but I loved it so much that I slowly put distance between myself and Tamil. I don't, I, I, I don't think I read as much in Tamil as I do in English today. So let me uh, ask you a question, yeah. Devi. Uh, you said that uh, when, uh, as you started to learn English, your alienation with, uh, with you know, uh, Tamil began. Anything in particular that led you to, to you know, experience uh, that alienation? Any causal factor? Yeah, there was this, you see. Uh, I'm talking about Bangalore of 1952 to 58. I mean, that's going way over a century ago. We live in a uh, district called uh, uh, That's where the, the poorer Indians live. And the cantonment area, which was defined by the Bangalore Museum and the MG Road, it used to be called the South Parade, and there was the Brigade Road. And to enter that, I used to be frightened because most people spoke in English there. And uh, as I, my first uh, foray into reading English was comics, you know, uh, Dell comics and the classics. And I used to put about 10 or 20 of those in my bicycle and uh, ride all the way to Brigade Road where a chap used to change them for 10 paisa per book after read. You gave your old one and you could pick new one from the big pile on the floor. I used to be frightened. Everyone spoke English and I couldn't speak English. I could read the comics, I could understand it. So it became a big desire. And then I started neglecting uh, Tamil and I thought there's a bit of an infra language. Everyone must speak English. And the alienation began there. And quite a lot of my generation did that. But uh, 
very proud of being an Indian though, that, that was true, but then English as an aspirational skill, that was there, I, I, I must admit. So, Let uh, me uh, speak about the much later, the further alienation came uh, as I went along. Uh, should I talk about it now or would you? Let me ask you actually, no, uh, let me move a little forward in time and let me ask you about uh, this, uh, you know, you've written about this on your blog, but uh, uh, you know, this incident on the train near Bilaspur and I believe that was something of a turning point in your, in, in your life and this is something that came fairly late in your life, I believe you were in your 50s at that point and uh, uh, as I said, you have written about it on your website, but uh, do tell us, you know, from a, a, a sense of cultural alienation to to a turning point, and that too in your, you know, uh, in your sixth decade of life. Uh, tell us about it. See, but that's uh, about my coming back, uh, uh, to, uh, finding my path back, uh, lost, alienated Indian, utterly unskilled in our ways, and it. it arose because of myself, the deliberate distance that I put. But I'm afraid, uh, I mean, I gotta go back a little bit. Uh, after my school, I went away to Bombay and, uh, and I started training for the sea, you see. Uh, I spent uh, three years in Bombay, uh, preparing for the Merchant Navy. And uh, as I went around Bombay, it was one removed. Like I told you, a cantonment area was English speaking. Bombay was almost like the best. So, in Bombay, I saw much and I was convinced that my future lay with the West. And I began to read in English. Uh, I read very widely and mostly what, the, what was popular then, Evelyn Waugh, Graham Greene, J.B. Priestley, uh, and all these people. And uh, so there, I, I grew further and further and I traveled the next 10 years worldwide. And I sort of disowned India. I thought India was, I did quite have it. We were a very poor country. That added to the disinclination to own up uh, to being the real Indian that I was inside and try to become a phony Westerner, an Englishman. And so, to come back to the question, what led me to the Bilaspur and the other things was, I came back to India and I settled down in a job. I left the sea and I got married. Uh, six years later, I was bereaved in my marriage. My wife died and I said, I was shell-shocked. So I said, instead of just resuming, I had a hectic social life and I was in business. And I said, let me go and find out what happened to me. I didn't want to get back on the conveyor belt and pretend as though nothing had happened and carry on. So I said, I'm going to quit everything and I start again fundamentally, but I didn't know what to do with, uh, fundamentally, uh, what I should be doing with myself. I still have continued reading books. So I must share this experience. <clears throat> It's almost a, <clears throat> a freaky kind of experience. Higginbotham's was a big bookshop. I used to haunt it. I used to be haunting the aisles all the time. I used to be there every week. And one day a book literally leapt off the shelves and came into my hands, so to speak, you know. And that name of the book, I won't forget. It is called The Secret Life of Plants. And that book is still there. And whoever is listening to the program, I would urge them to read it. It's still a dramatic, simply written. It's written by two people, by Bird and Tompkins. That changed me. I didn't know anything about the soil or trees. This book changed me. It showed me something worthwhile to pursue in life. That How? I mean, what was there in that book, The Secret Life, the Secret Life of Plants, that uh, really, you know, uh, grabbed you? Yeah, it's about the world of nature. I and it talked about diversity and how plants have sensitivity and how it can consume a whole life, how it can spend time immersing in the environment and how we have destroyed the environment. It talked about America, the two guys were American. They talked about how the dust bowls of America have been created out of fertile prairies in Iowa and Dakota and all these places. 
to how to fight back, how to combat the preciousness of water and the preciousness of natural agriculture. It talked all about that, the importance of trees. And I was all of 36, and I didn't know anything about it. And this book changed me. So I knew suddenly what to do with my life. I had been bereaved, but then I said, I'll buy a part piece of land and I'll plant trees, I said. So I bought a bit of sand dunes near Chennai and I was broke. I didn't have any money, little money. Uh, I started living utterly alone, very poor, but not starving, just enough to eat. But uh, I was muscular, I was strong, I was physically quite strong. I read and I planted trees, and I'm glad to say some of them are still there. But that's not the land where I'm now working on, that's the later one. This was my comeback. This book was a comeback. Going forward, I lived in a village uh, completely. I mean, it is only 25 kilometers from Chennai. But in those days, I'm talking about 1978, it was a rural park. I remember seeing a village play, Tirukutu, we call it in Tamil. All right, in 1981, I think, the last Tirukutu I saw in my village. It started at 10 o'clock and went down till 4 o'clock in the morning. It is a story from Mahabharata. I remember that. And I did not think about it. And the people were natural, happy. There were festivals, Tiruviras. I slowly started coming back into it. And I remembered my village trips when I was a small boy. And I discovered how alienated I had become. <clears throat> and then a little further, there's a second book that changed me. There's a book by Gita Mehta, uh, River Sutra. Uh, subsequently, the connoisseurs of fine writing did much like it, but for me, it was a great book. It was about the Narbada, and it wrote about the Jain custom of doing the Parikrama around the Narbada. They walked to the bank one way, came to Amarkanta, and walked back on the other shore and went back to Gujarat. This was fascinating, it was beautifully written. And that book changed me enormously. Because as soon as I put it down, I said, I got to go and see Narmada and uh, go to Amarkanta. And I had my train tickets booked. And that was in the year 1999. And that changed me. And they began to long for India, I lost. I don't think I can quite make a comeback because I didn't quite invest in myself in terms of Sanskrit and other learning. I'm quite bereft, I'm illiterate in, in so, this way. So, you let me ask, ask you, so what led you to uh, onto that train journey in 1999 and what, uh, what, what uh, you know, sequence of circumstances led you to find yourself in Bilaspur of all places? I mean, uh, uh, I doubt if you know many of us would have heard of the of the town Bilaspur. Those who have not lived in in Madhya Pradesh or what is Chhattisgarh now? No, Gita Mehta's book said how to get to Amarkanta and where the Narbada originated. He traced the origin of Narbada from Amarkanta and all the way to the Arabian Sea. And I made, did my homework. And I knew that I had to go to a place called Pedra Road and take a bus. And to get to Pedra Road, I got to go to Bilaspur. And that's how I found myself in Bilaspur. And I was happy to learn that earlier today that you have a connection with Bilaspur. I'll never forget the town. It was a dusty old town. It was a lovely old town. And then I got into the train and that's when I met this young couple. Sonu and Dolu, a brother and sister. Sonu and Bodu, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what they, I think her name was Rashmi, and she said, and I forget the boy's name, she was a ravishingly beautiful girl. She was a lovely country girl with, you know, equal to the English rose. It was lovely. And he was a lovely, obedient younger brother to her sister. And I had very little English, I mean, very little Hindi, but I was a brave, I mean, I braved on. I led them into conversation. And they opened my eyes. And the girl said something which struck me. She says, uh, I was asking 
see Singapore and the world and all that. And she said, uh, yeah. But I pray to Bhagwan that he gives me a husband who will keep me in these parts. I don't want to leave Anupur and check his death ever. This is the best part of the world. I don't want to ever leave it. And I asked the boy, what do you want to do? He says, Fauj. You know? I said, is that because of the Kargil War? It had just ended. But the sister interrupted very proudly. He says, no, 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 no. He has been wanting to go to the Fauj ever since he was a small boy. And that woke me up. I said, in the towns, there was a wanting to migrate out of the cities and go and become like I was. I couldn't speak for about others, that kind of a pseudo Westerner that I had become. And here there were these rooted people close to the soil. In the next three days, an Amar contact I met some extraordinary people. I actually wandered to a, with a Bill tribal companion to the woods there, and I actually saw a man living in a little hut. He was a sannyasi, and he was living all by himself. I spent an afternoon with him talking, and he shared his adventures. And I saw people sitting on the banks of the Narbada in penance. These are all things that I had only read about in books. So then I told myself that I'm going to go and meet more and more of these people and make my comeback. And that's when I began Good News India. I worked in it for six years. Am I telling you more than you wanted to know? Please let me know. <laughs> Oh, no, absolutely. I, in fact, wanted to, uh, you know, I wanted, uh, want to ask and I will get to asking you about uh, Good News uh, India. But, uh, uh, you, you know, you talked about, uh, uh, you know, people living in villages and uh, there was a connect that you experienced with the real India at that point. Uh, I, I want to ask you that, you know, people have said that India lives in her villages uh, and more than one, you know, famous person have, has said that. Uh, and. You have written about it on your website also, but can you elaborate a little bit about uh, that for us? That is, uh, what what was it in your mind, in your experiences that you that you had when traveling uh, through India that uh, led you to believe that that you know India was or whatever it was that defines India or defined India at that point could be found more in villages than towns. See, before that, I, I really don't want to uh, denigrate the people who lived in the, the towns and when they went out, they also played the part. But I think of the Indian civilization, that is India's civilization, which I'll openly say is subscientially Hindu, as a huge flywheel in, in terms of an a engineering metaphor. It's a giant flywheel bigger than the London Eye. And I think a number of people keep pushing it to keep it alive and it's spinning. And it's gained such a momentum, it's hard to stop. That's what has kept India's civilization going. And that's my understanding as a lay person who is not extremely well read. And these little gentle pushes are being given by millions of unknown Indians, you know. And they're all in the villages, they're the blacksmith and the village priest and the bullock car driver, and the farmhand and the landlords, and the people who maintained the village tanks, and the goldsmiths, the Vishwakarmas. There's a, there's a huge, like, it's like when you lift a rock, you see so many organisms underneath, you know. It's, it's a rock that we don't quite lift, and we don't quite realize what keeps India going, and what has kept it going for 5,000 years at a minimum. And these are the people I began to see, digging ponds, cultivating pieces of land, being responsible to the families, and being adherent of a Hinduism, which the learned Hindus, in my humble opinion, don't quite know. They are instinctive Hindus. And that's what I discovered. I think I count myself as one of them, because I'm not learned at all. But I'm an instinctive Hindu like them. And every village has a Shakti temple. In Tamil, we call it Mariamman. Uh, the worship of the goddess is there. And these are simple people, and they celebrate the festivals by the season. And you know something? It is not yet lost. I, I work in a village 100 kilometers outside Chennai now. Every week I go. This month of Katakam, 
Tamil, uh, in Tamil we call it Adi. All the poor people, the Belgian Indians are forgotten it. The poor people all cook a gruel in the home, every family, take it to the temple and share it with everybody. Just in Tamil it's called Kuru Vutate. There's also fire walking, the village shrines and temples. And this is the people I found, very, very humble people. And they don't need to be taught Mahabharata. And I got my Mahabharata from my aunt. And these people, I don't know where they got it. They all got it. But you know something, as an aside, I just want to tell you. In Tamil, in Tamil, there is no Yudhishtha. We call him Dharma, Dharman. You know, it's a popular name. You will find among the Dalits and the lower caste, many people named Dharman. And the word Dharma is, and they have not read the Mahabharata, they can't read Tamil, they have, they have probably heard a few dance plays in Tirukkutu. Dharma is interchangeably used for an upright man, a fair man, and also a, to do charity. And it's a popular name. And this is what fascinates me. And I start, I went looking for all these people in Good News India. I met many. And I, 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 I didn't write about their cultural work or everything. But what I'm trying to say is the people who are adding value to India, that was my search. Who was really adding value to India? Who was keeping it going as it has done? For 5,000 years. I want to ask you more about uh, you know this uh, part of uh, of you know our, our civilizational culture and the sort of you know civilization history that has uh, persisted for 5,000 years. But uh, before that, can you uh, tell us a little you know a little bit about Good News India? You know your journeys in 1999 led you to uh, start this website, and I think uh, you started this website in 2000 or 2001, and that was really, I mean, when the internet was beginning to get known in India and, the, you know, you started this website then. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, about Good News India and uh, its evolution and, and then you brought it to a logical point of, uh, uh, you know, a logical point in 2012, I believe. Yeah, uh, not 12. I'll, I'll, I'll go back a bit. You see, I always wanted to write, but I had never written. But I could, I did not either have the courage or the labor to write and send it to somebody and have it reviewed and published. But mm -hmm. the internet happened. And uh, just before 2000, I think it happened around 1999. And I must compliment, compliment myself for instantly recognizing its power. So I knew at once. It's a powerful new happening. And it used to cost 60 rupees an hour to go and serve in an internet cafe in those days. But I spent one or two hours and I was blown over. And I must linger here and share, it, share a little bit uh, about something else. You see, what I liked about my being at sea was it gave me enormous self-confidence and freedom and made me the kind of annoyingly independent and outspoken person that I am today. And that's because I knew that even if a rich man bought 10 ships, his son could not begin as a captain or a chief engineer. He had to start as a fifth engineer and crawl his way up. And I used to call my merchant navy as the Republic. So uh, an aversion for the dynasty or the hereditariness. Um, uh, began to take seed there. So going forward, when I found the internet and its power, and I must say that I understood it immediately, and I said, it's going to change the world. The information, I didn't know about information technology, but I had read a book, uh, I still remember his name, uh, Jean-Jacques Servan Schreiber, he was a Frenchman, and he wrote about the coming information revolution. I misplaced my copy, I lost it. I think I read it in 1970. He, he forecast it, but then it happened. The internet, then it happened. I said, now I can put up a website and I can write and I don't have to have anyone censoring me. So I can start writing. So that excited me a lot. I learned HTML and then later on I learned a little more skills 
PHP and database setting up. And then I set up the website myself. Every, I did it all alone, the graphics, the writing, the editorial proofing, the funding, the traveling, the reporting. I did it all by myself. Not because I want to give myself the compliment, but I'm incapable of being a team man. I'm a fiercely independent person. I'm not good in a team at all. I'm a reclusive individual. So that's how I began with Good uh, uh, News India. And then I jumped into a car and I drove by myself. I bought a car for that. I sold a piece of land and I bought myself a Qualys car. It was an aspirational car at the time. And uh, by the time I'd already into farming and I was into environment, I had planted quite a few trees, about 400 trees. I had built a windmill, cloth windmill and pumped water. And then I was on the road for the next six years. I rode that till 2006. And you know, that's, that's good news, India. It's still there online. I don't update it. <clears throat> I can't hear you. Uh, my apologies. I was on mute. Uh, I, uh, let me come back to you know what I had uh, uh, what you had referred to as uh, the cultural alienation. But uh, in many ways, we cannot talk about cultural alienation without also talking about itihas, about history. And I'm not referring to again, uh, you know, uh, I'm not referring to the Marxist, uh, leftist, communist, you know, rubbish that is uh, shoved down our throats. Uh, even today, uh, uh, you know, despite uh, having a, a different government at the center. I'm talking about itihas and the general alienation with history that the most urban Indians have. And for uh, what it's worth, you know, we learn about the invasions in northern India by, you know, people from Central Asia, Iran and elsewhere. But uh, if, 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 you know, you learn your history like I did in school, uh, we somehow learn that uh, the invasions in, in uh, that the south of India, southern India was somehow you know, it remained untouched by all the upheaval that the North witnessed over, over several hundred years. But we know now that this is not the truth. The South, the South India also had to face uh, uh, an additional invasion of a very different kind, hasn't it? Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it's much more subtle. It may not have been as violent as it had been in the North, but I was not quite aware. I'm a product of that invasion South suffered. I think it was enveloped by uh, evangelism. And, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what was that? Evangelism. And, uh, evangelism, okay. South. I think you were overrun by the Mughals and we were overrun by the church in the, in the South. And I'm a product of the church too. So I mean, I'm quite grateful for the education I received. But it was a very subtle uh, alienation it induced you. And uh, it uh, put a distance between you and your natural heritage. We were two people. We were one thing at home and another thing at school. And, uh, and then, of course, the fascination for English because of the jobs and all that. So let us not underestimate. We did not suffer as much violence as the North did. And we were a lot more settled than the uh, uh, North, uh, uh, North was. Uh, I have great sympathy for what, what the North Indians have gone through. And I think because of them, uh, uh, Hinduism has come through. They have been battered. But in the South, we are not battered, but I think we yielded a lot more ground than the North Indians have done. And that's my assessment at the end of 75 years. You know, it's very uh, counterintuitive. You would have thought that North India would have surrendered to alienation. But no, it is South India that it has done. And uh, North India has salvaged it. And uh, anyway, I do want to talk about it later. But, uh, the Islamization of India. Islam met its wall in India. You know? There's a first wall it couldn't quite breach and overpower. And, and that is, my heart goes out to all the North Indians who stood, who stood in the way. Whereas Christianity made a much better job of it in the South. It swept right across. So subsequently, the morphing took over. Uh, the communists came. I don't know from where they came. I don't know what constituency they originally had. Because, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about this communism. This agitates me. 
because uh, they have played a terrible role in rendering India where it is. See, I sailed at sea for several years, and four years, I worked out of Hong Kong on various ships, and my crew was Chinese, you see. I sailed with them. I was a second engineer. In those days, the Chinese didn't have too many uh, people to man the ships, which had British flags. And Indians and the British used to man it. The captain was an Englishman. I was a second engineer, and then I became a chief engineer. All the crew was Chinese. And they would all come from Canton. I don't know what it's called now. Uh, they come to get jobs. They are quite poor. And the Vietnam War was going on. You see, the common received wisdom in India is that China and Russia, they're communist. This is a little story they sold us. I tell you, I was there throughout the uh, Vietnam War. And in the four years, Mao was a nationalist who wore a communist cloak to get his things done. He pretended to be a communist. He was a nationalist. Ho Chi Minh, he also played being a communist. The only fools who got taken in were the Americans. They took them for serious communists and they said Dulles philosophy. It's all going to be knocked over. The world is going to be run over by the Reds. We got to eliminate the Reds wherever we find them. So they ventured into this war against Vietnam. China supported it for its own reason. And Russia was quite gleeful. At a very little cost, they could have the war going. But it's a mistake to call them all communists. Ho Chi Minh was a fierce Vietnamese. And as he proved after the Vietnam War, when China tried to wag its tail, he gave it a whack. He says, we, you and me, were communist bedfellows. The war is over. Now leave Vietnam alone. Vietnam will be Vietnamese. They are nationalists. They have thrown communism out of the window. Now, Mao went along with uh, communism for as long as he could. He wanted to get funded. He wanted to establish himself. And he lowered Chia Yashik, who was an American uh, puppet, according to him, who went to Formosa, which became Taiwan. I was watching all that. Mao was a nationalist Chinese. And Russia, I, I shouldn't be lecturing you, you know it, Russians are the ultimate nationalists. Going back to the Tsarist times, when you read Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace, the fierce nationalism of the Russians who stood up to Napoleon and subsequently to Hitler. And now they're thrown away the communism. The only guys who got the communism going is the Indians. And the only pl place on the planet where the last salon is done is by these fellows. I laugh when I see them. Vietnam is nationalistic. China is nationalistic. Russia is nationalistic. You know what Mao said? I, I must go back. I was fascinated by Mao at the time. There was one, no one could enter uh, China. There was a man called Edgar Snow. This book is still there. It was, it was proscribed in India uh, because we got a whack from China in 1962. The book was not allowed. It's called Red Star of China. He was the only person to whom Mao Zedong gave an interview. And he wrote a book about Mao and Lin Piao and Chow and Lai and all those people. And there I think he says, uh, uh, Americans are honest bastards. Americans are dishonest bastards. And that was, well, he was a communist. And Russia was a home of communism. This was Mao's view of communism. And now look at these Indian communists. They go and do Lao Salam. Anyway, they have reinvented themselves as cultural communists now, cultural Marxists. And uh, I, I would like to talk about it. So this is my experience. I don't know when they call it, call them Russian nationalists and Chinese nationalists and Vietnamese nationalists. Why are we Hindu nationalists? Why are they putting the Muslims out? Why are they shortchanging them? Are they not nationalists? I believe they are. They haven't denied. Why have the Christians not, why are, they, why, why are they not included in the nationalism? Look at this mischief of the Western press. They made me Indian, I tell you. I owe a debt of gratitude for this communist, 
and uh, uh, Western media, the Guardian, the Economist, and the whole lot. I thought jokingly, we were enslaved by England, now we are enslaved by New England, you know. And this is a slavery, and these guys it, annoy me. And I'm not a man who is known to pull my punches, and I don't mind saying it like I see it. So, I'm a nationalist. Russia is a nationalist, and to, today Putin is living it again. He's a pure nationalist. And look at them. They went and claimed Crimea. One part, they said we have a claim to it. And these fellows mocked at the Hindus, saying that they're going for Akhand Bharat. Hindus are not even doing it. Our Bharat began, they started at Kebu Darya, the Hindu Kush, and goes all the way. But you can't fault the poor RSS guys, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, for what they're not doing. They're not Akhand Bharat. The Russia is Akhand Russia. China is Akhand China. India is hardly that. And these fellows have their loyalties elsewhere and blame India. One thing good and grateful for India made the good Hindu. Fascinating. I, you know, uh, between the two of us, you know, you know, we could go on for at least a couple of hours just talking about uh, these uh, topics uh, on history and nationalism and, and communism. But uh, uh, let me come back to... Uh, uh, I think you again have it on your Good News India or the Point Return site and you, you write that a modern economy cannot create wealth and you talk about how traditional varieties of rice for example are being lost at the rate of several hundred a year. Let me ask you, uh, why, how, how do you define a modern economy to begin with and why do you feel that a modern, uh, you know, don't you believe that a modern economy would help reverse this loss of traditional knowledge that we have been experiencing? Yeah, no, I am not a Luddite and I am pro-technology and pro-progress and I do believe in Modi's Vikas. I know I am not popular among some of my friends for saying it, but I do believe it. It's not that, but I personally feel a civilization must have an ecological sensitivity. India always had. I'm a Hindu, I'm not a well-read Hindu. What fascinates me about Hinduism is the only religion which has got an environmental basis, insofar as I know, others can contradict me. The concept of the Panchabhutas. And for me, that is what has made me a fierce Hindu. The veneration of the uh, uh, natural elements and many years later, because somebody told me, I read the Nasatya Sutta. And it, it's a sheer worship of nature and veneration. So we had the groundedness and ecological, uh, the civilization was ecologically wedded. You know, in the countryside where I now work, I learned the Tamil months much later. All villagers named, they don't say January, February, March. Yes, said Tai, Masi, Pangani, Chitra, Vayakasi, all the travel months. And because that's the only way they can understand each other, which month what has to be done. So weddings are performed at a particular time. So we were very close to the soil. We must not lose that connection in the name of Vikas of progress. I like, and I get very irritated when uh, uh, people say, well, more than 5% of the people need not be on the farmlands. These are economic idiots, I'm sorry. They are mapping the American experience with the Indian experience. We are still 60% in farming. We got to make it better for the farmers. We got to lessen the muscular burden, but we got to have, uh, Hinduism will die if we went away from uh, our ecological moorings. And so, therefore, I say, we, we, we got to venerate our farming. We got to venerate our, uh, uh, our uh, treasure and therefore arising out of that is my conviction that the only two wells that a country and the people can have this is my personal opinion and I could be wrong it is infinite amount of water that you can store under the ground I esteem for water there's only a finite quantity of the water in the world I know there's not endless amount of water but 
we've got to grab and store the water like our ancestors did and keep increasing the fertility of soil. The more inches of fertile soil that we grow, the more stable a civilization will be. And on that, progress can be built, on that industry can be built. You see, one of my countries that I love is Japan. I'm a huge admirer of Japan. I visited it regularly for four years. You know, our Japanese, you will, if you had a plot as big as a handkerchief, you will grow rice in it. So on the one side, that's one culture I wish was a model for India. It has never lost its connection with its heritage. And it's a super modern, cutting edge modern civilization. And that's my role model. That's what I mean. Let's have technology. I hate disposable technology, but I like durable technology. If I have a plastic bag, I know that I carry cloth bags. But a big plastic tank that will last 20 years, that's fine. That's durable technology. Now we've got to make these fine cuts. So I'm not against uh, 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 progress, but we should not so rapidly go away and so completely get alienated. And that's one thing I go away every week to my land, uh, 100 kilometers away. And I must tell you a little bit as to how I came to it, if I may. Sure. During my travels, I met many, many people. And some of the stories I wouldn't like to own up now, I've got to say, I remember some people teased me about having an autographed book of a famous author. And I had a similar moment. I did a story on Advan Kejriwal. And I've come to my story. Yes. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I heard the name right. Did you say Arvind Kejriwal? <laughs> Let me sink now. Yes, I did. And I was hugely impressed by that guy. I gave him some money as well when he began the anti corruption thing. So I got as much as you to live down, Abhinav. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, anyway, but. I met some fascinating people. I saw a man who raised agriculture in three and a half acres with a hand pump and a well. I, I saw people who drought proof their villages with rainwater harvesting. So I found that this, and I met Anna Hazare. I have great esteem for him. He was hijacked by this fellow, Arvind Kejriwal. But his work in Ralagong Siddhi is phenomenal. You know, he has done rainwater harvesting. He brought the village back to life. He gave livelihoods. It's a throbbing life. He will be immortal for that. So I went and met him. He gave me a lot of time. And he, I spoke to him. So I came back at the end of six years. I said, I'm writing about other people's story. What is my good news? I have nothing to show. I was just a reporter. So I said, before I earned a right to tell people off, I must earn my brownie points. I've got to earn my tender foot badge. So that's when I went and took this absolutely barren line and started greening it. So that's what brought me. And that's the answer to your question as to why I value a country's uh, ecological basis. It was a must. So, and that is why uh, you, you named your latest venture as Point Return, and you say that the point is to return. It is, it, it is to return to nature what we take from it, and a, and a lot more actually we take from nature than, than we return to it, right? Yeah. I call it Point Return. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not well read in our philosophy on the thing, but I know my life. My life has been pretty long, and uh, ever since uh, Arikaran and uh, others and you suggested that I should talk, <laughs> I didn't quite realize that I had lived a quarter, three quarters of a century. And uh, I am a fiercely proud Indian today. I am a nationalist Hindu. Yes, you want to call me an RSS man, I'll proudly own that up. I don't care. But we have made tremendous progress uh, in this country, so let's not belittle that. You know, we have graduated a decimal system, we graduated a metric measure, and I remember from my school days that uh, I used to, make, you know, we had only a textbook, one textbook to share, and people took turns to read it for others to listen. So we didn't have, everyone didn't have a copy. And quite often I was asked to read because I had a loud voice. And I remember reading, it still rings in my ears, 
India is a large country of 340 million people. In my lifetime, we have quadrupled. And there were 20 different railways. And we integrated that, we bound it, we became a, 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 a nation. Along the way, I didn't know why we, we didn't ask the communists to get off the train, but then they are still around, fellow riders. But I'm very proud of all that. But now I think that we run the risk of cutting ourselves away from our ancestral knowledge. Because I don't know, uh, some of the learned friends in Indic Book Club can tell us the ecological roots of Hinduism. And I think that should not be forgotten. If you do that, you'll, you'll come out, you will disown a number of people who are living close to the soil. And they have internalized the Mahabharata and Ramayana better than some of the learned people. And we will cut them away from Hinduism. So an ecological basis for Hinduism is absolutely necessary. So instead of lecturing about it, nobody would listen to me if I lectured. I'm not capable of gathering with my audience. But I said, let me go and do it and write about it. And I said, the point is to return. And I think life divides into two phases. Everyone's life, according to me, there's one is the venturing, the other is the returning. And I'm in the returning phase. I have ventured, and I'm happy I ventured. I'm, I had excited adventures. I traveled the world and lived the world. I never lived to a template. I'm not a, a you know, the standard template Hindu, but I'm not returning. And that is why I said, uh, the tagline to my website says, the point is to return. And return to the roots, return to happiness, return the gifts received in life. The point is to return. A ghar wapsi, if uh, if I may put it that way, a ghar wapsi to uh, uh, you know to to the house that we have always had. So, DB, first of all, uh, you know, again, I'll say thank you so much for this, uh, you know, for sharing your experiences, your thoughts, your memories, your you know anecdotes. Uh, at this point, I would like to. Uh, what I will do is I'm going to unmute everyone, and uh, you can uh, uh, you know uh, you can actually uh, ask questions. Uh, if your line is not uh, uh, if your line is not uh, unmuted, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. So, please go ahead. Or if you want, you can even send in your question through chat. Uh, I am monitoring the chat, so if you send a question, I will uh, read it out, and uh, DB can answer it. Yeah, Abhinav, I want to go first. Please. Uh, I don't have a question for uh, DB, DBS. But uh, I just want to express my gratitude, uh, deep felt gratitude. I believe uh, IBC and Indic Academy is like a startup. And uh, for any startup, the first check that you get from any outsider who backs you up uh, is very important. And uh, for me, uh, the DVS commitment and his support when I met him last year, at uh, Bangalore. Uh, I was meeting him for the first time. I was introduced to him by my friend in uh, Singapore, uh, Anant Nageshwaran. And I met him in uh, Bangalore. And we were all uh, uh, post workshop, we were having dinner, we were chatting. And then he said, you know what, I like what you're doing. I want to give you some money. Then like, I was like, you know, <laughs> this is, this is, uh, this is the greatest thing to get it's a not-for-profit, but to get the uh, a certificate of endorsement of what you're doing uh, by somebody whom I just met that day uh, was an incredible experience. And then I went and uh, saw his farm. I also uh, spent a day with him. Uh, he was a little afraid uh, to, you know, this guy is like a dharmic guy. Can I offer him a beer? I said, sure, DBS, let's have a beer. <laughs> so we had lunch and we had some beer and then we had some good fun. And uh, after that, it's been an incredible uh, journey with him. He's always there. And uh, he's, uh, he's again recently given me some money for a new uh, work that we're doing uh, called the Indic uh, Activist Network. So DBS, I'm extremely grateful. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for being there and thank you for supporting me. Thank you. 
DV, you're muted. I think you need to unmute your line or let me do it uh, uh, for for you. Okay, anyone else wants to ask a question, you can unmute your line. Can I, can I answer? Uh, yes, please. Uh, Ari, I mean, uh, I, I saw a video by you explaining your vision. Uh, quite accidentally, in the academy, I have not known. But uh, that was part of Swarajya. I, I know Anantanageshwaran, my friend Anant, I call him. He writes for Swarajya. And Anant has been in a long time well wisher and a great friend. And he was one of the early admirers of Good News India. And uh, I told Anant, I said, I want to meet this person. So by the time I was convinced that someone had to do something about Hinduism that was being buffeted by the communist guys and others. So, you know, strangely, it gives me an opportunity to tell you a little bit about money. I was not born rich. I came from a very, very modest family. And I didn't have money till I was 50, 55, 60. I don't know where my money has come. I have considerable amount of money. I'm quite smart when I want to make money in the stock market or, or whatever. I do, but I don't anymore. I don't chase money. But there is the money I have is disproportionate to my intelligence, hard work, or goodness. Uh, that's honest. I'm not being falsely modest. That's absolutely honest. I have a feeling that it has come to me for a particular purpose. And I got to find the purpose. And uh, I am very, very fiercely devoted to salvaging this country. The hands of these vampires or the hawks that walk the country. But uh, I, I hope uh, Abhina will give me a, uh, a chance again to talk about the political views if you want to. But the next question, Abhina. Oh, anytime. We would uh, be, you know, we'd be thrilled to have you again, uh, DB. Uh, Dimple, you had raised your hand. You had a question? Yes, sir. DB, I mean, it was really insightful listening to you. And it's my proud privilege to know you. I mean, the little that I know of you. I just feel that, you know, you have truckloads of books within you. Uh, can we see some book coming in the near future probably? And I believe it's your birthday sometime soon. I'm not going to say when. Uh, do we expect some book from your end perhaps? No, I think for me a full length book writing is far too now. I think it's a, I got far too many things committed. I don't think I can. Uh, I, I hope to write articles like I've done. Uh, and I was uh, diffident, and you, Dimple, were of great help, and you are my literary agent, you promoted me, and you got me published. I was mighty excited. All these days, I have published everything I wrote, and this was good to be, so I hope to be able to write, and the politics, and the secular humbug, uh, uh, that angers me, I write best when I'm angered. So I suppose I will write. I'm not a cool writer. I'm not a scholar. I'm not an objective person. So I don't know what books, but thanks for asking. Thanks for thinking that I have a book in me. Who knows? Thank you. Thanks, Abhinav. We'll hope. We'll hope uh, that a book comes out. Okay. Uh, so obviously, uh, if uh, you don't have any questions, or if you think of a question uh, later on, you can uh, send it on the Indic uh, group, or you can uh, send, uh, you, you can tag DV on uh, Twitter. His uh, Twitter handle, I believe, is Straws in the Wind, and uh, you can tag a question to him. You can even tag Indic Academy on Twitter and ask your question, or uh, you know, uh, Indic Academy is also on Facebook. So you know, keep the conversation going. Uh, thank you, DV, once again for this uh, wonderful Indic uh, chat, and thank you everyone for uh, uh, for for you know uh, tuning into this uh, Indic chat. Uh, we will put this up on YouTube shortly, and thank you once again, and have a good day. Thank you, Abhinav. Thank you for talking to me.